Hello and welcome back to Exposing Human Trafficking, Valentine's Day edition. Um, this is um, about what I used to do when I was in ministry. Um, my ministry, part of it, I had a few different outreaches. Um, one of them was to go into the sex industry places and get girls out of there. You know, a girl in her early 20s doesn't need to be in a strip bar, at a lingerie modeling place, at an escort service. I've been in those places, and a lot of them are fronts for prostitution and sex trafficking. Again, you know... I don't know of many women who want to be prostitutes. A lot of these girls that are in this industry have been abused many times. It's sexual abuse from when they're little girls. Um, they become of age. And this is an easy way to make quick money so that they can get a place to live and food to eat. Um, trust me, I've been there. I've not done the strip bars and all that stuff, but I do remember trying to find a job when I got out of college and I was in Florida and there were no jobs and most of the girls that were desperate enough were going into these places to work. Um, I remember when my older stepbrother, George Bermudez Jr., and my stepfather, George Bermudez Sr., were trafficking me and making films. I complained to Brad Pitt, who was supposed to be my fiancé at the time, and saying, I'm sick of this. They're, they're making more movies. They're raping me. I can't get help with the cops. I can't leave. I don't have enough money to leave. And if I leave, I can't leave my younger brother and sister because they already threatened they're going to do it to them. And of course, my mother doesn't care. My mother knew about the abuse. She was told by my aunt and uncle when I was a little girl, but she was being blackmailed about my true paternity being exposed, and she chose to protect herself and her reputation over getting her child into a safe environment, which my aunts and uncles were willing to help her get us out. And I wasn't going to do the same thing to my younger brother and sister. I wasn't going to leave them in an unsafe environment. I was going to try as hard as I could to keep them safe. So I was on the phone with Brad and I was complaining about the situation. And of course, Brad Pitt, the most wonderful human trafficking boyfriend you could have, says to me, oh, I don't mind. Just as long as you make enough money to come back out here. That was his reply. And I told him, for that, I would go dance at one of these strip bars and take all the money for me. And I do not want to do that kind of work. I do not like that work. I think it's disgusting. You know. So when I began my ministry... What I would do is on Valentine's Day, um, I'd already have some little goodie bags arranged. 
I put in like candies, nice candies too, not some cheap ones. Um, you know, like little chocolates and um, those little boxes with the, it's like the sugar candy. They're made in a heart and they have things written on them like be mine and, you know, I love you. And, um, of course, Hershey's Kisses and all kinds of things. And I put them in these beautiful gift bags. There would be, like, some kind of scripture in there, like either a little New Testament or Gospel of John. Um, you know, something to give to these girls. And I would walk into these places. I didn't wear my minister collar or anything. You know, I just put on a pair of Daisy Dukes and a tank top so I can get past the bouncer and the owners. <laughs> you know, of course, have my nails and my makeup and my hair done and look just like one of them. Okay. And um, I'd be like, oh, I've got some gifts for the girls Valentine's Day. And they'd be like, oh, go right back there. Go back to the dressing room. They knew, you know, just let me in. Because they thought I was one of them. <laughs> Sometimes you feel like a Charlie's Angels doing these things, right? I was a Jesus Angel back then. And, you know, I'd go back there and I'd, you know, talk to them and say, Oh, I got some Valentine's Day gifts for you girls. And um, some of the owners knew, you know, who I was. And the girls would always say, You're from church. And I'd be like, how do you know? She's like, I can feel it. But meanwhile, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm showing cleavage. I'm showing butt cheeks and everything. I got, you know, high heels on. <laughs> they could tell the spirit of goodness was in me. And um, so sometimes... Um, girls would say, oh my gosh, thank you. This is the only Valentine's Day gift I'm getting because of my work. Guys don't want to date me and they don't take me seriously for a relationship. And some of these places were nasty. I mean, there was one place that I walked in and they were changing the sheets. It was uh, modeling you know, lingerie modeling, but it, it was a brothel. Sometimes girls were drugs in there, you know, sometimes, I don't know if they were under hypnosis, but their eyes were glazed over, but they weren't high. There was one bar I walked into, and when the girl saw me, she was on stage, she jumped off the stage, came over to me, threw her arms around me, and just started sobbing incessantly. Nobody that I ever met wanted to work in this industry. I never met one girl that said I grew up wanting to be an escort or a stripper or a lingerie modeler. I met lots of girls. Some of them were in there because they were escaping abusive homes from their childhood. Some of them wanted to study. And um, I knew one girl that her husband was an attorney and he had kidnapped her son um, when they got separated. And since he knew the law, he was circumventing everything. She hadn't seen her son in two years, and she was working there to be able to afford a lawyer so that she could get her son back. There was another girl that I knew that was on dialysis. She had kidney failure. And because she was over the age of 24, she was not able to get health insurance off her parents' insurance policy um, since she was, you know, end renal. She couldn't really qualify for, like, um, 
some kind of Medicare supplement. She was fighting to get disability. But every other day she had to go into the dialysis clinic and go get dialysis. Um, she had tubes in her arm that she held down with um, type of ACE bandage type of material so that the clients didn't know that she was sick. They thought she just had um, an elbow injury of some sort, um, you know, because you get injuries, you know, from dancing and doing things, you know, pole dancing, believe it or not, is a sport. It's not, you know, just you hang on it. It, it takes a lot of strength. And you do see a lot of girls with taped up ankles and wrist and elbows and knees and, you know, it's, it's like the Olympics, you know, it's like gymnastics and ballet and acrobatics. And it's, it's a very, um, hard thing on your body. And so I, I was in church and I mentioned to people what I was doing every year. And I was trying to get more of the ladies to come with me because I figured, you know, I was doing maybe about a hundred, 200, 300, depending, you know, it kept growing as I kept finding more places. And then I began doing it on other holidays too. And so I was like, if we had like more people, we could hit the entire area, you know, as opposed to me going into certain small neighborhoods, you know? And what I heard at church was, oh my God, I can't go in there. What if someone sees my car in the parking lot? I was like, then tell them to pray for you because you're going into the enemy's camp. Oh, I couldn't do that. Well, didn't Jesus tell you to go to the byways and highways and go find the lost? And that was the attitude of church. So I was like, screw it. I'll just keep doing it. And a lot of places ended up closing. But it just goes to show that Christianity, most of the time, is churchianity. Where people just go to meet and socialize and have pie and after service on Sundays. And they don't care about the loss. They don't care about the suffering. They don't care about people needing things because they're already saved and Jesus loves them. But then someone like me that's really trying to help ends up getting traffic more and more. Is that sweet? So at one point I had gotten a bit frustrated because some of the other places didn't close. <laughs> But then I went back to this other church. I went back to Without Walls. And I was talking to one of the ladies. And she said that um, hundreds of girls had been coming to that church. Um, because they had gotten something at work. And they wanted to get out. They had been given a little gift on Valentine's Day. So without me knowing, things were happening. I know that we can do something like this with victims of human trafficking. It doesn't have to be religious. Um, it's harder. Like, yes, you can go into these places that I mentioned but there's other places like truck stops and um, just bars. I, I knew of another human trafficking ring that was going out of a regular club, nightclub bar, where everybody would go dance. Those, you need a better strategy. Um, I know with this one ring, all the girls had a, the same tattoo. And so that's how the, you could identify which ones were in it. But it's one of those things that you got to really get to know the environment and start watching 
who's talking to who, who's going where, who's going outside, you know, every like 15 minutes or so. And you have to kind of watch what's going on to be able to recognize that there is human trafficking going on. Um, if you're interested in doing something like this, I'll tell you the truth. It is a lot of fun, but it can be dangerous. Get a hold of your local human trafficking um, outreach place and let them know that you would like to do something like this and they might be able to tell you. I would not go into one of these places alone. Um, going into the bars and giving out gifts on Valentine's Day is one thing. It's pretty innocuous. It's pretty subtle. But going to an actual human trafficking ring at a truck stop is a whole different level. Um, and it's something that you want to be with some kind of organization that can train you and tell you uh, what's going up, how they do it. Um, I know that some places they might leave like cards and phone numbers in the bathrooms for, you know, the women to get help from human trafficking. I've seen that. Um, so I don't know, think about, you know, if you're interested in doing something, you know, the Bible says faith without works is dead. And there are lots of lost and hurting girls out there. So think about it. If you got any questions, post them down below. If you have any suggestions, again, post them down below. Um, I do believe that if you get involved with your human trafficking resource um, agency in your local area, they've got more than enough things that you can help them with. It may not be going out and leaving little messages for girls. It might be doing some housekeeping it might be helping them get uh, supplies. I know a lot of girls, when they do leave, they have nothing. And they provide clothing and toiletries, as well as lodging and food. Find out what you can do with these agencies. Offer your time. Offer your resources. Maybe they need money, you know, to pay for bills. You know, maybe they need groceries. I don't know. You'll have to reach out and ask them how you can be of assistance. If you liked it, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. Um, subscribe if you haven't. Hit that notification bell. And share, share, share. So there's not one more victim of human trafficking. And on this Valentine's Day, go show the love to those who feel that they can't be loved. Because part of the reason why these victims remain in human trafficking is because they think they're horrible and unlovable. Thank you very much.